what's his name? Is it Strava? Flava. Flava. Um, and it came across that one of the graphics you had inserted. And I was like, oh, I should put that in. And then I went to, <laughs> and you had already put it in. <laughs> yeah, the tendency of my graphics, they sometimes confuse more than they explain. So we just have to be careful with that. No, that one I thought was pretty good. The, the yeah, the four different thing projects kind of, I don't know if that's got everything, but it was a good one. So I actually just, um, I have questions for you, Arthur. First of all, you initially asked me to write something up from the meeting you had last week about the literature review tool. That was the initial thing you asked me to do, which was a meeting, I, as I understood it, it, was these were domain experts, kind of biomedical researchers of various kinds. And you said it was an extremely helpful meeting. And you kept nodding, going, oh, this is great, this is great. And I have to say, when I was listening, I was like, I'm not sure what it is that he thinks is so helpful here. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's, the, yeah, and there is that definitely a, a reason why it made so much sense to me and why it's not resonating as much to you. And that's uh -huh. only because I have a baggage of three months just like <laughs> guessing of like, what are we doing? Like, it, does it make any sense? And like, is this useful to anyone? And whenever uh, we had that meeting, it just like, there were a lot of positive signals. Not like, you know, this is exactly what you guys are doing and it's super useful, but like just signaling of, hey, like there is some validation to it in, in the real world. Does it make okay. sense? Yeah, sure. But was there some, like, I guess I was wondering if there were some action items you took away from it or something that you want, you wanted me to write that meeting up. And I was like, what is it? I think your document accomplished that even okay. if you don't, don't feel like it did, <laughs> but for, for many other people that read that document, they finally understood what we were doing, especially oh, really? people that are less technical. <coughs> I still feel like I'm, uh, it's not all clear, but okay. So this is something like what you were hoping that I would write. Um, and I feel like I'm starting to understand the, the Corona Y ecosystem a little bit. Um, so, but where would you like me to go with this next? So to me, the thing that would be interesting would be to dig down a little bit on each of the, the status of various things, the benchmark, the status of the different NLP approaches, <laughs> mm -hmm. challenges of each, in which I assume that wouldn't be information that you would necessarily provide, but maybe some people who are working on those things, like if you, wa if you thought that would be useful or not. Um, but we could, we could definitely go through some points that, for example, you want for your understanding where we're standing right now, again, in terms of implementing those. Because I remember like in that document, there were a lot of comments about, is it AI or not AI? Like, are we actually doing this or is it just in plans? So we could definitely discuss those. Okay, right so now. you'd be helpful with that, Anton? Yes, to, to some extent, yes. Okay. So I'm like, what I'm doing within CoronaWire is essentially this TPM role is being connected between all of the different projects. But then you know, a lot of projects are hidden. They're like incubating somewhere within CoronaWire that I'm not aware even about the existence. But eventually they will be planted on our common data infrastructure. And this is where I will learn about them for sure. And I will kind of, so where we guys are standing, et cetera. So I could spoke about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe you and I can talk more about some of those yeah. details without Arthur having to be on. Yeah, actually, well, I mean, Arthur, Arthur is in the same shoes as well. So it just, we're slightly covering different angles because, again, it's not possible to do everything at the same time. So uh, this conversation for Arthur are uh, like fun as well. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, actually, I got double booked and I have conflict with calls and I, uh, I have another call going on right now that I'm also like participating and I'm, I'm going to jump off in 10 minutes. Oh, okay. If you, could, if you want to jump, then yeah, go ahead. So yeah, I I'll be here. Question that maybe, maybe Anton can <coughs> cover this mm. clarification about the benchmark. So there was something okay. that part of, part, one of your comments that you put in, um, you said these 
tables are manually created now, but the goal is to generate them as soon as possible with AI tools, which we already have. Mm. And are you saying you would continue generating the benchmark with AI tools, or is it that you finish the benchmark, you train the, the NLP using the benchmark? And it's fluid. Like there is no like, uh, the, you know, it's not binary. <laughs> Like you, you keep generating benchmarks and you keep uh, curating it for like future reuse. Oh, okay. So in terms of building AI, we're truly that classical uh, definition of we're building a system that, you know, uh, has a specific goal and a set of benchmarks associated with it. And now with the more data in, it's, it's supposed to get better and better results on top of the data in achieving that, that set goal. And in our case, we start, we, we want to start, everything we do, we try to start with uh, like valid data provided by human experts. Then we kind of try an AI that first will just aid those experts in terms of what they do. Then, but eventually it's supposed to get bigger and bigger weight in their workflow process. And then if at first medical expert was the guy who provided that, like let's say, okay, here is a table summary table of my meta research of that topic within COVID-19 papers. After some point, the same guy will be like, instead of, hmm, I need that table. So they got the table and then obviously validate the result. If something is wrong, they provide feedback, the system improves later on and so on. So in terms of kind of being at first, you are the guy who grabs the shovel and digs right into specific problem. Now it's, an esca like uh, excavator type of bulldozer machine that you just simply say, okay, dig in that direction. And then you just like steer it a little bit. So we kind of going, I mean, th this is the direction we're going. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Artur, did you want to hop off then? Yeah, I still have four minutes and, and I'll hop okay. off. So I promise to do thing, more. So just to kind of like, uh, I watched uh, I, you like Arthur and uh, Katie like your previous call, and you were like discussing. So I would like to kind of add a little bit of context, like from my perspective. Okay. Uh, so uh, since Corona, why again? It's not. I mean, what, I know when people get confused, they start asking this question. So what is your product, right? So people kind of by default assume that there is like one tree we are growing, right? And it's kind of, yeah, we have multiple branches, et cetera, but it's definitely not one tree. Corona Y itself is kind of like this rainforest. It's definitely an ecosystem. That's why it's really extremely hard to understand what's going on initially because we have different types of trees are already kind of growing. And the only common thing we know is they, all the trees are like, you know, use photosynthesis to generate you know, energy and their processes. We know that they need nutrients in the ground. We need to water them, etc. So you can view all of those like task risks, task geo, task VT, all of those as just simply a different vertical scoped projects or trees. But then we also having like this ground level of common data infrastructure. This is what Slava is, is essentially leading that direction. And a lot of things that, so from the perspective of data infrastructure, all of the separate trees are like labs, lab environment. And our goal is to provide scientists with microscope, maybe high throughput genetic sequencer if they wish and so on. And what we do initially, our first Kegel round one submission was essentially, it just like this wild west cowboy action. So everybody just plants trees. But after that we observed, hmm, these guys likes to plant, you know, high growing trees. These guys plant uh, trees that likes, need a lot of water, et cetera. So we kind of uh, get that information and then build our irrigation system for our rainforest. This is quite a sense. metaphor. <laughs> well, I mean, again- We're we gonna learn that use. Anton is the master of analogies and That's metaphors. incredible. Uh, Don't yeah. ask about the bees. That's <laughs> There is other things, but anyways, so we're building this irrigation system. And now this irrigation system, essentially all of this AI NLP pipelines that we utilize. And this is one of the things that the moment when we expose what we do on this horizontal level, 
a lot of people who are just focusing on their specific tree got like totally blown out of like what's going on for a simple reason. For example, if somebody was working on, if you take uh, our team search engine, so this is essentially basis for our literature review because to, to form those tables, right? You need to find those papers to begin with, right? And to find those papers, you need to build like, again, this, you need to collect the data, build a knowledge graph on top of this, et cetera, et cetera. So again, knowledge, like all of this NLP pieces, they're part of this horizontal team that we're like gradually building layer by layer. And last week we start, for example, for our data lake, our dataverse, so datasetscoronavirus.org, this is where we host all of our data sets. So majority of coronavirus thinks that we are focusing on core 19 papers, just all of the scientific articles, but we're already beyond that. Our dataverse, we're, we're, we're parsing through all of the GitHub repos related to COVID-19, and soon we will be adding any whatever other resource we have there. And what happens is we, we have it on our data lake. So we don't have only core 19 articles. We have somebody who wanted to do a projections of how many you know COVID-19 test cases would be there. They created a simple CSV file with columns, you know, like date, how many, you know, like new cases, uh, recovered cases, you know, how many like severe cases, etc. So if we see on the internet some like CSV file like that posted, we grab it into our dataverse we create metadata on top of that CSV file, like column names, yada, yada, et cetera. And now that becomes, again, this basis for like building a knowledge graph on top of all of the data. So imagine this, somebody reads a paper from Core 19 data set and they, this is the paper about risk factors and how, let's say like um, uh, how humidity or some other climate factors affect it, right? So from the paper, using NLP tools, we're extracting these entities. Oh, there is something mentioned about climate or humidity. But at the same time, we could search within our dataverse and find the connection between data set that also has, you know, a CSV file that has date, humidity, and some, you know, like what was the temperature. Now we also have our initial CSV file with number of, you know, test case, new test cases, severe cases, et cetera all of that data could be combined, right? So in a sense, this is what our data infrastructure, we're going to the point that all of that type of stuff, you, you, you get into uh, our kind of this knowledge graph on one node, but you can immediately get connected to everything else. And for example, today we announced that guys, like for all of the data we already grabbed from the internet and created some of the metadata, now that metadata in itself as a data set that you can play with and start building knowledge graph, for example, on top of it. And that blowed my, like, uh, like there was like total science for a couple of, I mean, like a dozen of seconds or so people were like, what? So even though it was team search engine, that kind of this horizontal team that was supposed to think in these terms. So collectively, Coronavai creates something really next level in terms of technology. And uh, that's why it's kind of hard to grasp this, but it becomes much more clear when you just simply, okay, let's not focus on this horizontal level, this knowledge graph, yada, yada. Let's focus on literature review tool because we know the user story, those Rockefeller Institute folks essentially told us what they want to know. Like, oh, if you guys do metadata on top of the articles, what will be helpful for us if instead of just having these keywords that authors provide, you can create your own set of keys and also tell us that that key comes from intro, that key comes from, methods, uh, from method section, et cetera. And we kind of like, oh, you know, this is exactly what, like the task of that NLP causes in pipelines that our NLP folks are doing. And now we're essentially channeling that information from literature review type of vertical into horizontal thing and eventually and like we'll have that automated almost fully and then again it get used again by literature review team and that's vertical and all of the other trees as well so that's kind of why irrigation system is a i think it's an awesome analogy here 
because we figured out like for that specific tree, what type of water and set of nutrients we need to deliver. Then we build this initial first kind of channel of, of that, you know, pipeline of delivering those nutrients. But then we're not limited to that tree. We scale for any tree that could use that. And eventually we'll have this network effect of, of this process. And that's why it's so exciting what we do with Corona Y. Okay, let me see if I can restate any of that. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, it's a huge elephant. Let's start with like, uh, with just a, an ear of an elephant. Yeah, yeah. So I think I'm, I'm just trying to get my own, uh, the way my brain thinks, which is not mm. as a computer person. So, um, okay, so the example you gave of, a, there's a research paper, humidity and mm. COVID severity or something. Yes. And, and you're saying that because once you've found that paper, it could potentially be connected up with this data set that you scraped from the internet, mm -hmm. you put into what you call your data lake, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Because that data set might have humidity and disease severity in it. Yes. And so you could, the person who found that could then go from, from the paper, which gives results on one data set can mm -hmm. then find this other data set to analyze and work on. But you guys wouldn't do the analysis and work on that other data set. You would, it's just that. So the idea, again, like from infrastructure perspective, we don't work with the data itself. Our goal is to build that connections, mm -hmm. but maybe somebody either within Corona Y or maybe outside, they will want to do this. So, right. uh, you know, this, this classical uh, conundrum in research, like you find the paper, but then it's not really reproducible because you don't have the data set. And now you go, okay, if I can't get the data from authors of the paper, let me find similar data set, right? So in a sense, we want to cover that type of issue with this like infrastructure, because you read the paper and then you're kind of like, oh, I need to figure out the way, can I validate the methodology? But on my data, maybe I already have some data set, but I'm missing some of the pieces that I got inspired now to search for the data from this specific article that I just read. So essentially we're providing that type of infrastructure. So the person reads the paper, kind of gives this uh, recommendation of possible candidates for data sets for, for replication of, of those results. They start running it, I mean, do something with it. And since they will discover it within our Corona Y, whatever we're building here, because it could be a literature review tool or some other tools that we'll be building. Because again, we don't know exactly what will uh, grow uh, further and fastest, etc. We just right now, again, irrigation system only. But ideally what I see is again, Rockefeller researcher start using our tool like this literature review. So they start reading one paper. In a sense, they do this you know, Netflix type of thing. They watch a movie and then what is the next movie for me to watch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is simple. So they read the paper and then they see another paper and then we provide this metadata to them so they could validate that it's indeed the movie they want to watch next, right? The trailer maybe or reviews or something, right? So they validate, oh, it's yet another paper that I want to read. So they start reading. So they're already in the coronavirus ecosystem, but at some point, any researcher goes to the point of this. Okay, I just read like a dozen of papers they are all wrong. I have a hypothesis. This is how it all works. Now I need to validate my hypothesis. So I need data for it, right? Mm -hmm. Where do I get the data? It's another kind of burden of, of any researcher out there. So in a sense, what this literature review will be part of the bigger picture of when beyond the scope of these tables, this specific vertical, this tree, we kind of like, guys, we have the full rainforest over here and now from just looking at these tables, now you start looking, oh, wait a second, there are multiple tables, like data that are already somewhere there out in the wild that I can go and grab from, for validating my hypothesis. And now they, again, they ideally should be on, within our Corona ecosystem, join our efforts, our team grows. We provide the computational infrastructure for them to actually work and you know, do some computation on top of the data, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, 
that's how our community grows. Like all of this lab environment, these experiments, because that person who just joined, discovered the data set, created something with that data set, eventually what the result would be another data set, right? That we again add to yeah. our so, and again, it's this idea of open science, this data lake is supposed to be something where different, you know, rivers collect, where you have data streams that go into your data lake and it just grows, grows, grows. And now you also build this kind of different tools, NLP slash AI pipelines that could grab the water from the lake, do something with it, but eventually it will all go back to the lake, you know, the circulation of water in the ecosystem. So this is essentially what conceptually we're building. But now again, it's a huge elephant in the room. Nobody is capable of even grasping. I can only see one side of the story. Slava sees another side of the story. Arthur is kind of like, hmm, how I ride that elephant, you know? And eventually we're kind of discussing all of this and, <laughs> and eventually we're kind of like, hmm, let's build this literature review tool. We have the data in that, you know, we could build the pipeline to kind of, uh, to validate how our ML pipelines will generate the tables because we can compare them between, you know, machine learning generated and human curated. Okay, it's, it's a well-defined machine learning problem. Let's do this. So at this point in this project where we are, we have a web app that has this functionality for, uh, curators to interact with the data, right? But now we kind of like this confusion, like, okay, so what do we have on the table? How relevant are those entities that they extract? What, what do we need to automate over here, right? What is the actual value? Because again, it's not about per se copy pasting tables over there, right? It's actually for us, go back to core 19 data set and start replicating the result of humans to create that, those tables. But now we want it as a tool that could be, I don't know, maybe 65, 70% as accurate as human curators on initial launch. I think it will be really good enough. So it hasn't been created, tested, right? Yes. So uh, regarding, I mean, what we have right now, we create collections of some data, the data sets. So for example, for specific uh, question, which is not dynamic, it's predefined question, we could create and generate the collection of, of papers. Now we have, it, it, at this point, it's this joint pieces, but we already have pipelines to extract something from papers. So for example, to detect uh, if something says, you know, weather and then let me like temperature and it's like high temperature, you know, like this M grams and things like that. So mm -hmm. we have pipelines that, so we have like, it's, it's like, you know, Lego bricks to build our Death Star. So we have all of these pieces that we're discussing right now but we still need to integrate them. And in terms of, uh, in for, to, to do integration, it's again, the process in itself with a metric of success. And right now, for example, like again, this was part of your conversation with Arthur Rowe last time was, right, is like, what we actually seen in those tables, what the actual value, like, is it p-value, but p-value is supposed to come with some hypothesis, right? Where is the statement of that hypothesis? Right, so do we need to extract that as well? And then there was like this, I know, not really proper communication with the uh, Kaggle team who are kind of giving us the direction where that tree should grow. Uh, but I think like, I mean, from my perspective, because I'm coming from this ground level, this irrigation system, I'm looking for everything from this time. Like, I'm like, okay, what, what nutrients should I, we pump into that direction? Uh, so to me, it's kind of clear the tree should grow up and for me up is very clearly defined But for other people for sure, especially who are like, okay, so what type of tree are you growing? Like what type of branching is there, etc. So uh, We could probably dive into this specific thing for literature review more if you, if you wish Okay Well, your metaphors are helpful, but I'm not sure if it's gonna help me with I'd still just I feel like I need um my metaphors right now were for this big elephant, right? Yeah. But now we need to kind of focus on this specific thing. I don't have really great metaphors there yet. That's why I wanted to pick for with you and we'll come up with it. For the AI literature review tool itself? We, yes, yes. I mean, part of it to me is I want to understand 
where is it right now? So what I see is mm -hmm. this benchmarking table mm -hmm. that's pretty great, actually. I mean, as it is, but it's all hu basically human done, except for you're saying first, the first sort is uh there is an ai tool that decides which papers are going to address the specific mm -hmm. questions that were provided by the doctors isn't that right so there's like 68 questions or something yeah so the idea right to create collections i right. mean at well, least initial collections for so in a sense what we do for specific questions we're filtering out irrelevant papers right and this we have for some of the topics because essentially task risks did it for their set of questions task ties did it for their set of uh, questions that they were addressing so we have this different pieces that kind of work for that subset of questions now it's not automated yet so it's still manual process so you need to run that python notebook to essentially do all of this so next steps in, in terms of putting that closer to production is, okay, we need uh, kind of package those pipelines so they'll be more universal, right? So we need this classificator essentially, is this paper, is a task ties related or is it task risk related, et cetera? The moment we, we're done with that thing, the next kind of incremental step is, okay, why we're focusing only for our task teams? We have this huge list of questions. Let's expand our classification pipeline to this, what is provided in this example of literature reviews of these collections. And how we will, uh, like, that data set that we have provided from Kaggle essentially is our validation set of our classificator for that. Because- I want the- The-, the, the the tables that we have right now provided by Kaggle, uh -huh. right, this human created ones, this essentially we will use to train our classificator, you know, to, to whatever we'll be able to, uh, accuracy to achieve. Then after that, we have this classificator. Now we could create these collections for, no. So we start with, here is the question, here is humanly curated list of articles. Because again, right now we don't, focus on columns in that table, we just rows, right? Here is a set of papers that answer that question. So we take that, we create this classificator that takes the questions and could tell for any paper within coordinating data set that is, is it relevant to this question or not? And we have validation data set. After we have this classificator, uh, what we could do is now from all of the papers in Core 19, we could filter out all of the papers that not classified related to this question. And now we have humanly created set of papers and now this like machine learning curated data set of papers. Now for this one, we could take and start building this extraction, like apply our n-gram, all of this entity extraction pipelines that we did, for example, uh, for, for specific risks, now we could kind of, for every specific question, we need to figure out like what type of entities we need to extract. And we know what we want to extract. We have a set of articles that we know are related to this question. So whatever we extract from it should be exactly what we are looking for. We're not extracting this entities from some like random paper about financial markets during COVID pandemic, you know? Mm -hmm. So in a sense, we have this multiple steps in terms of what we do, but every time with every step, we kind of have a defined goal, what we're trying to optimize at that step. Then we achieve whatever good spot we're comfortable with in terms of accuracy. Then we slightly switch focus in terms of, okay, now next goal is to automate this process. So at first, we just want to know a set of, articles that you know if you if you if you have specific question to answer here is a list of articles that you probably all of them you need to read mm -hmm. right at this point but now oh you don't have time to read it here is our tool that extracts all of the data that you need, you need to skim through and maybe you will from that you'll be able to find and focus on which papers to read and etc so eventually we're kind of getting to this point that 
after multiple stages like this will be in the spot that a user puts down a question we start kind of cre I mean, we, 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 we essentially run through all of these epochs, all of the stages, and eventually the users got the stable of, you know, every row, a specific article, claim, and whatever p-value, whatever like those entities that are valuable for that kind of literature review are there. So this is how I kind of like see what, in which direction we're going to. Now this p-values, all of those type of things, provided by Kaggle. I'm also on the same page with Arthur. It's not really clear. Is this exactly what we want? I'm kind of closer to thinking Wait, that, that our- by, Can we go back a second? Because you said that before about right. these tables were provided mm -hmm. by Kaggle. I thought these manually done tables were something Corona, why people were creating. Uh, so like we have a set, I mean, we have our people within Corona, why also, kind of curating, validating these collections of documents. But the one you see on CoronaMed website, I think that is that, I mean, like it's definitely that set of documents uh, has the data set was, that was provided by Kaggle for round two competition. So that's the, whatever, 1800 papers or something like that. They've yes, already yeah. been annually curated to, to yes. determine which ones address the 68 questions and or not. Yes. And uh, okay, so I thought that was a product of Corona Um So, I mean, like there is that collection of data set. Then we have our collections that we created for Corona Y for round one, for example, risks, uh, ties, uh, VT, what VT stands for, virology, viral transmission or something. And then, so in a sense, that's hard. To, within Corona Y, like within our rainforest, it's really hard to communicate because there are so many things and for whatever data set anybody mentions, we already have enrichment on top of it. That's why like a lot of confusion is happening. But in terms of, again, like product, um, so s some of those collections are Corona Y community result. Some of that was provided. I think Kegel took Dr. Tayab. Have you watched those like uh, no. conversations? So if you look, Dr. I think Dr. So Dr. Tayab worked with Corona Y with us also regarding these collections, mm -hmm. and then he started work. I mean, worked with Kegel as well, and then some of those things. So. Some of those collections are also crowdsourced. So in a sense, like we can't like the the what we have on Corona Med, it's an effort of a huge amount of people at this point. And some of them were like coming from Kaggle community, I think. Some of the I mean like outsiders of Corona Y. Some of them are actually contributed through Kaggle, but they are actually, I mean, they're part of our community as well. And then from Corona Y itself, in addition to provide it from that, we have our own collections of, of documents that I'm not sure that are on Corona Med at this point also. So again, that's why it's kind of this, this confusing part. Oh. But in terms of data, I mean, data is coming all over the place. Let, let's put it that way. So like, this is what the unique situation with this COVID-19 pandemic, at least how I see it, is that Everybody, like it's truly this collaborative environment on a planetary scale. There are like no competition and like everybody contributing to the pool of, of data and et cetera. And we as a coronavirus community, first of all, we were managed to grab the pool of people who are kind of participating in this whole world of COVID-19 related research. And at the same time, we're building data infrastructure to gather like the data produced in this whole world but again it's our forest but we're trying to kind of make it bigger and bigger we're like we're building rainforest like amazonia rainforest and our goal is again eventually for the community to grow itself as well so what is product of corona Y to me is the community and the data we we're producing that's it everything else is just tools that we're trying to do and for, for this literature review, it's again, it's a huge compound. Outside data, 
inside data, because all of the medical experts when we're talking about within CoronaWire, they're they are not exactly those members of CoronaWire as well, right? Because usually the people who you want this un very well annotated data sets, they're probably part of, again, Rockefeller University or something. So they're already busy with that work, right? So in a sense, we get them and we're building tools for them to, to close this feedback loop of quality data and assurance, et cetera. Um, so does it make sense? Like, is it making more clear or no? Well, certain things are clear. <laughs> I'm not sure if they're the things uh, that I, it's like, uh, it's more like, I knew this a little bit. I was still fuzzy uh -huh. about that. Now there's a whole other bunch of things to think about. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> I went from knowing a few hairs on the elephant's ear to knowing a few uh -huh. hairs over on his belly. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> But Stop. here, here is the cool part. At least we have one elephant. At <laughs> least, like for me, I definitely see that there is one something that attracts people. So the core, there is a core. It just like the more people you talk about it, the more viewpoints you will see it. And it's definitely this really like multi-dimensional space. That's why it's extremely complex. That's why, like for, for me every week like every time i'm syncing up with arthur something net like uh, something new happens you know and you can like oh so we're doing some traceability ai project that's kind of cool and you can like how it kind of fits in everything and initially it it's not connected at all but then eventually you kind of see wait a second those people rockefeller guys they actually want traceability of what we will provide so now it makes sense why we have this Slack team that working on traceability of AI component, you know? So in a sense, it's definitely this small bites of all of this. And sometimes I just simply like zone out, like okay, I have no idea what's going on. It sounds cool, let's do this. You know, if there are people who want to do, let's do this. Yeah, I just, I guess maybe, I mean, it's not like I come from a hugely hierarchical sort of world, but it's like, I kind of want somebody to be in charge. It's the way I feel right now about the protests. Who's in charge here? <laughs> exactly, right? But I mean, and, like, and it's you, such you know a that... effort and it's like, it's great that it's grassroots, but I want, I don't know, somebody to take the action items and, and make sure they actually get somewhere. Okay, are you familiar with Valve proposal, Valve flat structure proposal that we have uh, within Corona? No, I saw it in the no. presentation, but I didn't know what it was. Uh, okay, so uh, we have a, a, so there is a company called Valve. It's uh -huh. a game, uh, game development company, and they also have Steam platform for, for gamers to uh -huh. purchase games, install them, yada, yada. So they were famous to actually, in, in corporate environment, employ flat structure where, in a sense, when you get employed there, there are no bosses, so to speak. Hmm. So, you, but I mean, there are still leaders, there are still tasks, but they're kind of in a fluid environment, they get informed. And for example, like, let's say we have this AI literature review tool. Now we need somebody to actually implement this, right? And in order to do this, you need to take some data in, create some ML pipeline, validate the results and kind of launch something. So right. it, somebody will definitely take charge on it and will be what, what you're describing as this. It's not about hierarchical, it's about people who are actually implementing this, right? Not just setting up, but actually execute the steps. So according to this valve structure, it's everything supposed to be split into like this deliverables. What is a deliverable? Deliverable, it's something that two, three people could team up together. And at Valve company, it literally means they take their tables and move them together within their like open space environment. So they like essentially the team that's working on literature review is kind of sitting like close together. In our case, here is a Slack channel for AI literature review. So we have people kind of all sitting and discuss like initial discussions, what are we doing here? What are the plans? What are the steps? What is like the master plan maybe? But after like the next step is 
creating a deliverable. Deliverable is like, okay, I am taking charge and I'm building the classificator that for given question could classify is the paper related or not, right? And I'm creating initial documentation, which would be essentially like this doc, like, a, uh, have you seen any examples what we usually follow, like from day one, like our well, first document like that was similarity matrix or similarity function. Uh, and it was just simply like, here is our goal. We want uh, for, for given task, what are the set of papers are there? And we, we needed only a rough idea at that point. Then there was like motivation, why we're doing this and proposed solution. And then after that document was ready, a next person simply jumped on it, implemented it. The results were there published. Like, okay, here is, here is a published data set. The next day, another person saw the document, saw that, okay, here is a published data set and created visualization on top of it. So on the third day from initial document, here is what should be done, we get the result. So this was kind of this task that we could call task over here. So it's a task and a group of two, three people working on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and th again, this is just the, pro I mean, there are some other things in terms of traceability of the results, yada, yada, that's the whole proposal. Again, uh, I could probably, if you're not on the channel, we have a, a channel kind of that, that was incubating this proposal. Now we essentially employ this flat structure in a lot of ways within CoronaY, but some of the pieces are still missing. So it's, it's not fully employed, not fully embraced strategy, but it kind of works this bottom up type of thing. So in a sense, we're definitely at the stage of riots without like this leadership, but we, all, we have some demands ready, you know, it's just kind of like why people are protesting. Some people protesting, some people are looting. So again, looters go outside, but those protesters, they're peaceful protesters, though there are angry protesters. But there is still this core that everybody is going through, right? There is like this, you know, enough of like police brutality or enough of, of that. So we're at already at that stage that we kind of know where we're going. We kind of know how we could act. So tomorrow, 4 p.m., we are marching on that street, right? But in terms of this leadership, yes, we're definitely not there. And I'm not sure we'll be able to go in that direction unless it's specifically mar like March on uh, Market Street, San Francisco, June 10, 4 p.m. Like for that, we could definitely do what you're describing in this hierarchy. Here is like the leadership, the guy who will make sure that, you know, people are signing up to the mailing list or something or uh, making sure the task of... Oops, I lost your video and your audio. You there, Anton? Ah, okay, hold on, it's just Zoom, Zoom troubles. Mm. So in a sense, for, for literature review tool, I think this project is kind of long enough. And at this point, I think we'll, we're ready to get this, you know, like combat league, let's call them that way. It's like not that leadership hierarchical one, but more of a combat unit leader, right? In a sense, what, what you're creating, right? In that document, it's just simply summarization of plan. Okay, we need to do that, right? And then afterwards, Having that, it will be much easier to form these small task teams that will kind of take this smaller elephant in the room, but still kind of grab them in bites and start, you know, cooking. Okay. Uh, um, I guess I'm still, like, if I think about this, um, I think I understood something you said earlier. Let me see. Uh, you were talking about, um, well, I was trying to understand the benchmark and how that's going to be used. And I, mm -hmm. I did, I sort of understood, uh, I guess from that meeting that I listened to, mm -hmm. that they were asking people to look at the tables and make any corrections to things they find, right? Yes. It, well, and, that and is, and, and, and when you said traceability, is that what you mean, tracking? 
any changes that are made and then it feeds back into the AI so that it learns from its mistakes or and, and then you're saying it's sort of going to build like that is that what you were saying earlier at the very beginning I think you were talking so about. in oh let me kind of um, go go through this specific example because I think it will be a good illustration so right now we already have uh, like an interface between like people experts and data and right now the data pool is just specifically this set of articles with this set of entities extracted from those articles this is those literature review tables are there we have corona med web app that essentially provides this uh, interface and now right now that data we know it's already curated so there are no need for any edits hmm. But now we know that it's only like this specific collection of papers. We want more, right? We want more data there. So we, we build this ML system that essentially creates those collections of articles. So now we pump that data set into our Chronomed web app. Again, just interface for, for experts to, to interact with the data. And now they will see that, you know, some of the, so, Right now, all of the data is already curated, so it's kind of ground truth. But after ML uh, data will be there, ML generated data, there'll, there'll be possible mistakes. Now, any expert that interacts with the data will kind of say, like, hold on, what is this line about? First of all, this is not related to this question, you know, ejected, or it's related, but uh, p value is not exactly what, you know they probably get interested in this paper, they're reading about it, and then they find that something within paper is either contradicting or not exactly what got extracted by machine learning. So they could kind of highlight it, annotate it, and then say, okay, here is, was a mistake in your ML extraction process. So we got that information as an input for our next iteration of improving our machine learning uh, pipelines. So in a sense, uh, we, we're closing this loop. So we start with the ground truth, small, but ground truth data. Then we start amplifying it with machine learning. Then uh, this machine learning data get back to human. Humans curated again, and we get in. So uh, let's, let's consider an example. Uh, initially, we have small data set, 100% correct, right, or validated. Then uh, we, we amplify this data set tenfold with machine learning. So now we know that for 10%, it's validated, already curated by humans. But for the rest, our accuracy, let's say 60% only. So we will have another 60% of this added value that, that is correct. And we'll, we just need to validate it. But we need to identify that 40% that is not accurate enough. It will be provided by, again, humans. So now, as an input for our machine learning for stage two, we have not only initial ground truth data set, right? We have extra like 40% or vali already validated from the, the pool of machine generated from stage one. And it will be both good examples and bad examples. So our classifier becomes even better, right? So another iteration we could again, clarify this data set that we provide this collection even more. And now even more people, human experts will get even more relevant results, which means they could curate it even more effectively and, you know, finding uh, mistakes quickly. And after a couple of iteration, I think it will all converge to some really good results, at least from my experience doing, uh, so I was doing PhD in computer science I was working with biologists and I was doing this iterative algorithms. And usually if you have system like this, that has this behavior. So you start with step one and it's good results, amplify, do this again, fix this set, curate it, et cetera. Five, six iterations and you get really, really good results out of there. So in a sense, I think in our case, it will be even less because after every stage will be just Better classification means better filtration of noise from collections. So in a sense, we only will be tightening, tightening up the, the data set of relevant papers. 
this is given that COVID-19 is not growing by itself because in addition to this, we have COVID-19 data set of article is growing and we need to filter and curate the data set. So in a sense, it won't be a closed ecosystem, it will be open ecosystem. So our classificator classifier will be better and better. Okay. Um, well, so if you just look at this as one deliverable that you're headed mm -hmm. for, the deliverable you want at the end is something where uh, the literature data set gets updated daily with new papers. Somebody mm -hmm. goes in there and they can automatically grab the literature review for the questions that they are interested in. Mm -hmm. or, or, they, or would they even be able to ask new questions? Oh, okay, so what I was just describing before, it was essentially questions are fixed, everything is kind of fixed. Um, Let's leave Ideally, it. Down. I don't need to. I don't need right? to know because it's a lot easier that way. Because you guys do that categorical sort mm -hmm. at the front end to get rid of the irrelevant. Um, yes. So and it, and again, in, in a sense, this is just like let's say we have this huge elephant. What Corona wise is, is trying to eat? We're now literature with just one leg, right? So what we were just discussing right now that was you know like first first section of a leg. The next one is essentially like. Can we dynamically create this? Here is the question. Here is this set of articles. And for that, it definitely will be, it's on the roadmap, but in terms of um, kind of where, where are we standing right now as a machine learning expert myself, I would say, oh, I'm not sure we have all of the necessary ingredients to, to, to have this metric of how good we create this uh, dynamic question, dynamic collection. Uh, but in terms of uh, like light, like a time frame to achieve that, I think the moment when we will uh, get this collections for fixed question that are provided to us, right? This this process. After that, uh, those classifiers that work. First of all, I mean obviously they were tweaked for one question. After that, the next step is to make those classifier kind of like tran do transfer learning on top of those classifiers for new questions. And for that, we don't like, we don't have any input data just to see how, like how effectively can we do that transfer learning. But I, I have high hopes that we'll be able to, to manage that because uh, if we can do transfer learning well yet, again, nothing stop us for another set of questions, go to experts and say, Guys, can you create a curation, like curated data set for us? And now we go back to our initial process. We start with 100% curated data set, apply it, like amplify it with machine learning, and you know, again, close the loop again. So in a sense, no matter what we do. do for, you kind of have to do that for each question, which is a fair amount of manual work. Yes, but I mean, ideally at some point we will be at the, We'll, we'll, we'll find this inflection point when we have enough data and our classifier becomes generic enough that it doesn't really depend on a question anymore, right? And at some point, that, that point will be there. And at that time, you're kind of like, oh, wait a second. So we don't need this manual labor anymore. And I guess this is our like, kind of greater goal is to get to that point. You started to say time frame. Um, I wasn't really asking that, but it's an interesting question. Uh, uh, again, just time frame for then Corona Y is a interesting topic because everybody is a volunteer, and uh, even even if within corporate environment, you know, like I, I was recently reading some report, so essentially like big four companies in Silicon Valley. So how well do their engineers who are like arguably, you know, cream of the top, mm -hmm. how well can they kind of provide the timeframes of, of doing this and that? Yeah. And even for them, the factor was three, four. Mm -hmm. So no matter like what the people say, oh, in a week we will have this, multiply by three and four and it will yeah. be more accurate thing. Within yeah. Corona, we are worse than that because I mean, 
from my experience and my observations is some things that from my experience, I'm thinking like, oh my God, it will take us like within startup environment, moving really quickly, it should be like three months at least. Two weeks, we have it. And I'm like, why is that happening? And it happens because a lot of members who join Corona Y, they're not just simply coming here to learn. No, no, no. They're bringing some of the tools or skills or already ideas that they want to experiment and implement in real world from their like previous life, yeah. maybe from their corporate world or maybe through from their research or something like this. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, that's why timeframes are totally like lost, like time is lost concept within Corona I think, <laughs> you know, we only have the steps and stages. So I, I started thinking, you know, in a, in a format of milestones. Okay. Where do we want to be? Okay. I want to have that classifier that for given questions can tell me for any paper, is it relevant or not? This is the milestone I want to achieve. And be like, after I achieve that milestone, it will be much easier to achieve some other milestone that is, you know, dynamic question. And here is the literature, some summary table of, of that review. So to me, I'm kind of seeing all of these different milestones that we're trying to achieve. And for some, I personally, from my experience, can gouge that, you know what, in order to achieve that milestone, we will definitely solve that other low hanging fruit. So in a sense, again, let's go back to our trees. I want to reach out that the best <laughs> apple at the top, but I know that it's over there, but here is a smaller apple that I still need to eat something before I, you know, uh, climb over there. So let's focus on this apple first, because at that point, the moment we grab it, we'll be already not on the ground, but on the first branch. After that, I know that, uh, like, I'm, I'm, I'm not, like, after we on that spot, I know that all of these milestones are meaningless because they're not moving you towards bigger goal. But I definitely know, okay, this is the next one. Classification for fixed question, classification for dynamic question. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, kind of at some point we'll close the feedback loop and we have this amazing AI literature review system with a man in the middle to, to, to have accountability of AI. We, we have the whole process already like automated and it's much quicker than it currently happens for when researchers just do their literature review manually, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. I probably have more than my brain can handle for the time being. <laughs> I know he recorded it, but this is Arthur's uh, Zoom, right? So I don't know what he... Yes. Did they get posted some specific place if I want to pull this up? So we, so we have... you. Like The thing is, I don't know how this video will be, get handled because Arthur is a host. He needs to like stop recording. But eventually, it should be uploaded to our Corona Y YouTube channel. Okay. So this is where all of the, our conversation... So, I think like 80% or 90% of all of our talks are getting recorded and posted there. But obviously some of the talks are, you know, people not comfortable speaking publicly or, uh, you know, there are some kind of constraints like we can't just simply talk publicly if it's some partnership or, you know, something like this. But otherwise, YouTube, Corona Y, just, just Google, you will see all of our daily calls, this type of calls. Yeah. And uh, uh, probably it will be under the same tag as, as your conversation with. Uh, oh, is that up there? Yeah. So I, I watched what you were discussing with Arthur before. And yeah, he took me, I was like, oh, you're posting this? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like some people get kind of a, uh, not freaked out what's the right word just kind of like caught off guard a little bit because it's definitely yep. not by default right but uh, i think it like it, the fact that we were with this open community that everything is out there just go watch what we were discussing if you have something to contribute pin us on slack and we can continue our conversation is actually was exactly that tool that made it all happen because most of the time, uh, the way it all was working was this way. Arthur 
speak with somebody like you are and then like kind of like, oh god like i just spoke with katie it's like perfect she she was able to summarize like all of my thoughts and, and stuff right mm -hmm. and immediately after that i'm like hmm okay i have a lot of thoughts that i need to <laughs> kind of push through and um, again hence why like i'm on this call you know versus me like ah probably not worth it i'll just watch a recording next so that's how ideas and all of this gets propagated within corona why just simply by people with with this tool that you can asynchronously be everywhere imagine this like our like what why are we better than any corporation well because you can be at most of the conference meeting that happen within our company right if you work at i don't know even facebook or something you still can't watch both what happened at fair department with cool research, right? Or in data infrastructure that uh, maintains the database, Hadoop database or something, right? You can't be anywhere there. That's why they need a lot of PMs, TPMs, engineers themselves also getting lost and everybody kind of sits in their cubicle even though this space is not cubicles, but they act like they're in cubicles. corona is different. It's like we have a lot of people and again, it becomes, to the point that it becomes a problem. But I know some members who are like literally everywhere. You can like, dude, I thought you were part of that team, you know, but they're kind of interested in everything. And at some point I was thinking like, damn, that's a problem. We need to kind of limit this process. But then I start seeing fruits of, of that process because mm -hmm. For example, we get the conversation within Team Search Engine, which is kind of this infrastructure team, highly technical. And we were discussing one concept and what we're trying to achieve to do. And then maybe a week, week and a half, maybe two, I'm seeing in another Slack thread, people discussing this and some other people not related to Team Search Engine whatsoever were essentially proposing similar things. So mm -hmm. what we're starting to see that ideas are like uh, a boomerang you kind mm -hmm. of throw it and then it goes around 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 and two weeks later boom somebody else shows up and like so guys we need this specific thing from data infrastructure and we were like damn it we are ready because we thought about it two weeks ago or something but you know you're realizing that all of these ideas the way that why people come to you is because initially you launched that boomerang somewhere or maybe you're not the person to launch the boomerang but you're actually that person who linked it mm -hmm. right yeah. for example like we speak together i told you my crazy metaphors etc but then you use it with somebody else and then i'm listening daniel presenting and <laughs> using my analogies i'm like hmm that's a good analogy. That's why I like using them because I see they work. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you're pretty good at the analogies. Now we've got the boomerang, <laughs> the forest, the lake, the streams, the, the fruit. We've been Again, through a lot. <laughs> like the more you, the, the, the more you will like, will, will more communicate. You will actually start noticing that I'm like, this is what, so I'm, I'm talking with Arthur was in this type of conversation like a lot and after like three months or whatever we're communicating so we know each other only three months so now he he complains to me that I'm like the guy who likes silver bullets you know like kind of one solution that fits everything and in fact all of my analogies are always describing the same thing always you'll kind of like start noticing about me that I'm actually kind of always this start trying to describe something that is this specific core of an idea but then i simply know that i i'm not the best communicator that's why i'm using different analogies etc but then eventually they all converge into kind of one simple thing that kind of like there's the sets that corona that org go look what we have there and you i mean people people who are like Technical will kind of understand after all of my this crazy analogy. They kind of ah, so that's what you mean by that. Uh, I'm not sure what will be a good example for for you to kind of see what I meant, and we already have it up and running. Probably we're not there yet. 
but eventually again we will build this uh, literature review tool and then we'll kind of oh so that's what we meant during our this call that is on our youtube so it'll be interesting you know get to to the point when we already have this product that other people get from first try and then go back and revisit exactly this conversation how we were describing it and just see is it actually what we've built eventually or no mm -hmm. because that, that is interesting yeah, yeah yeah well it i i'm just amazed at um well maybe there's more in the ecosystem that i haven't seen but there, there's not a lot of written material describing you know what i'm trying to do here mm -hmm. which i sort of feel mm -hmm. like I, this is how i process information <laughs> i need mm -hmm. to understand it and write it down and say here's the points and what what mm -hmm. is what's happening over there and then you know kind of um use words to get mm -hmm. it nailed down like here's what you're doing here's what i'm doing okay let's go do it that that's like i need that <laughs> The Don't. thing is, it, it's not only you, we as an organization also need that. This is essentially missing piece is, this is what I was referring partially with this traceability of results. Mm. And we have people kind of focusing on actually how to make it happen. Because right now we have this, this like within community, people who write code because they just, contributing they kind of don't have really time to document things and yeah. now people who have documenting skills they are like we haven't found this common language how to make sure that they speak with people who actually code and implement things right that's why documentation piece is missing a little bit but mm -hmm. now we for example task vt they have a huge initiative how to create a really replicable process for that so they use read the docs but it's again this is more for engineers from that team uh, but for like the rest this level of organizational knowledge that will pass from team from first wave of volunteers to second one we're definitely missing it that's again why i'm excited that that you're on board because we need more people like you who essentially have this like okay guys all of these talks are great. I understand that YouTube video about this is awesome, but you know, where is the Google doc about this? Yeah, right? yeah, what does it so, mean? Yeah, yeah, what, what it means and essentially, so we need to set up that process for sure. And I think from that initial do like document that, that you created based on those calls initially, you can kind of see immediately we have some this buy-in of people co co like commenting. Like Dan Sosa is great. Like the moment if you want to review something, you always just send him like the link, like, hey, Dan, we have this either proposal or this specific kind of uh, direction. What's your thoughts about it? And at some point he will like find time and he usually kind of like, I don't get this piece or I like this piece, you know, he gets like this solid scheming feedback. Other people as well, um, the only, like the main, blockers for that type of operation is just simply visibility because usually it's not enough to post the document like on slack for example like hey guys we just launched this or here is crazy idea we're trying to pursue here is the proposal it's not enough to do that one usually you need to make sure that a couple of influencers within corona y also saw it so they could pump it more to mm -hmm. to channels they know and this is for example what tyler always tries to do on slack mm -hmm. uh, and again he has the crazy brain that is capable of all of this huge community interactions to keep in mind who is doing what a little bit uh, because i'm also doing that but i'm already over capacity like literally i have sometimes like teams like who are you like what do you guys do like last week i had this moment and i'm joining i know that for a uh, hr team they're trying to automate their process, so they need infrastructure for this. So I'm like, okay, that's a job for me. I'm jumping on call and I'm joining the call that I found like some link that there was a scheduled call for like 2.30 or something. I'm joining in and people admit me to, this, to, to the conversation. And it's like four people and first time I'm seeing them. I'm like, uh, okay guys, is it Corona Y? They're kind of <laughs> like, yeah, it is. I'm like, oh, okay. And I know that, for example, Tyler should be on that call, but he was kind of late to join. So I had this weird, like, four minutes or something that I'm like, 
who are these people? And they're like discussing something that I have no idea what they're discussing about. And I'm like, hey guys, uh, second uh, question. Is it human resources? Are we going to like, talk about like that CRM or something? Like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, good, good. <laughs> and then finally, like everybody joins. I'm like saying, oh, okay. So at least Tyler, I know. But the rest of the people are like, and they're all telling me like, oh, we're here from like uh, third day or something. They tried, and I'm like, wow. So the Corona Y in itself is definitely like this huge elephant that it's extremely hard to kind of comprehend what's going on. Yeah. Like probably Arthur is like the only person who at least tried to see from every angle. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of the person who saw the elephant from technical implementation angle. But some of the areas are not part of our elephant yet. And we already have some, I don't know, it's so, some other pieces. Some so it's definitely forest. So I definitely know that we have more roots you know, in our irrigation system, then I'm aware about the trees at this point, mm -hmm. you know? So it's just a question like, I know, okay, here are some roots, they need some water, okay, let's provide it. Then see maybe when the tree is big enough, we will eventually definitely see it and make sure that it's got better visibility. It could be plugged in into our rainforest ecosystem, so. So, I mean, I guess that makes me worry about the, the topic that I talked about with Archer so much, which is the tendency of CS people to think, you know, to go about solving problems without mm. uh, the domain expertise, without knowing what are the mm -hmm. medical people really want. I mean, that's what I liked about this AI tool. I actually like those 68 questions that came from somebody who said, this is what I really want to know. Yes. And so that you guys can figure out, okay, how do we provide that? And you're really, it's really um, keeps you grounded in, Mm -hmm. Something that's really going to be value a value out there, but if if there, you've got a bunch of CS people, you know, kind of creating roots in various things with no, uh -huh. with okay, fruit, with no fruit at the end. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So here is the thing: like within Corona White, we don't have exactly CS people; we have data scientists. Yeah, okay. We actually like this problem. Like I like I know exactly what the problem you're talking about. In fact, we don't really have it. Our really? people are dead. Like, I wish we had that trouble when we have people who just want to implement cool stuff, this roots, build roots everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm in fact looking for people like this more. But what type of our typical personality is kind of a data scientist who they don't tie to technology that well. So they're not about building tools actually that much. They're about using cool tools, yes. But what they actually care about is more about data. So they want data and then they want like what the data could be used for. So that's why they're also excited about this literature review, the, the, the way that direction is framed because exactly, there is well-defined questions. There are well, def like it's clear what type of data you're dealing with. And now it's the question is like how we, what model to build what type of classifier or classified entity recognition and so on and so on. So we in fact have that type of brains within our community, I mean, technical uh, parts of our community. They all think that way. And for example, this explanation of this horizontal infrastructure that I was doing at the, at the beginning of the call, that stuff doesn't resonate with our technical people well, only with really like, I mean, some portion obviously resonates and they're kind of like, oh, that's cool. Like we want to engineer this. But majority are actually very product oriented people. You know, they're all like this. Okay, so what is the scope? Is it like this knowledge graph for everything? This is again, uh, very ambitious to do. But if it's kind of like, oh, it's for COVID-19 that I said want to build knowledge graphs on top of it. Okay, I kind of get it. So we have people working on this. Now this literature review again, specific tasks you can split them so the milestones are more or less clear we just need to put them on paper for sure so the people who are like more of a like reading and, and stuff so okay well so I, think I, 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 I wouldn't worry like with this like like don't worry that much that we have these people who i want to over engineers but why right i think it's we definitely need to define what the fruit is Right, it's kind of like because somebody like, oh, is it apple or is it like an 
know, like a lemon. I don't want to do lemons. I want to do apples, right? So for that, yes, this is the missing piece. We just see like a blob of, we know it, fruits are there. But everybody is fruit oriented, like very, everybody's like majority of communities, product oriented people. Okay. Well, that's good. I mean, I look at stuff on the Slack page and I don't, you know, people post these things that just look like nonsense to me. It's code or it's, I don't know what it is. And I'm just like. <laughs> so right now, what also happens within our Slack Initially, it was majority of everything was like public channels. Right now, the areas that are actually kind of focused people, this product and focused people, most likely they will be within some closed channel because they kind of started two, three people. They created their, not, not because they want closed channel, just for Slack, there are no functionality to have this unlisted channels, you know, oh. like on YouTube, you can have, the public video search engine works on top of them then you have unlisted so it's still public video but people can't look for it unless they know where to go and then you have private videos so slack has only either public or private but what we actually needed what we found working is this unlisted channels but we don't have it that's why people start with private channels and then unfortunately turns out you can go from private to public within slack and a lot of teams already have like huge private channels for like 40 people, but mm. it's private because incubation stage of when it was like three, four guys was private. And then they, they kind of start onboarding people, get in, get in, get in. And then in a sense, we, we get into this problem of like stupid Slack. I mean, it's a great tool, but it's still stupid because it doesn't like, it limits us now in terms of what we do and, for some teams, for example, if you go team search engine, we kind of like, okay, let's just archive our private channel before and just have public one and mm -hmm. it worked. But other teams, it's not feasible. There are like so much context even that private channel that is like people just stick to it. So, uh, I mean, I will, let, let me add you if you're not there yet for this Valve incubation channel, like this Valve okay. flood structure, how, the proposal how to structure execution of steps and it's actually exactly what you wanted to do is like everything should be documented so that if people who execute something disappear they're volunteers after all we could just keep going like the torch is still there just somebody else pick it up and moves so you'll kind of like see this kind of process how this private channels work yeah. um okay i i don't think i'm even in the um AI lit is there a li AI literature review review tool channel? Okay, hold on. Let me double check. I have a lot of the general and communications, and I have one. Yeah, called those those communications are. This is where we have again. It's uh, there is a lot of creativity happening there because there is something unique within our community. So there are no existing tools. That's why people try different things posting a lot of like crazy ideas let's let's put it that way and uh then okay let me invite you first to valve channel it's um, a newer boom let yeah, me okay, do this so again you can kind of see what type of conversation goes there now um ai literature review hold on Okay, I found one team. Okay, so there's a public channel for it. Let me double check that you're already there. Probably not. Again, this is public channel, so you can you definitely could search for it as well. I've only had the a very minimal interaction with Slack before this. Mm -hmm. I mean, enough to sort of get the idea, but. Um, okay, great. Yeah, luckily you you joined like right now when Slack is not. I mean, we have majority of our conversations as I said is either private channels or DMs, but the activity still on a really high level. And if if you joined 
like around sub, run submission one for Kaggle, that was crazy. It's like really like you go to sleep, wake up, and there are so many unread mentions, DMs, etc. It's like was not possible. Like, I was spending literally three, four hours a day just to kind of uh, keep up with things. Yeah. Just to keep up, not generate new things, not to coordinate, just to figure out like what's going on there, just to, to make sure we're not missing or losing some, some ends. So is there something I could read that would explain to me what happened in phase one and you know, what was submitted and, and what, um, you know, any documents? That oh, I think we got, we had an idea, like we wanted to do like a, like a webinar on what was done. Oh. And I'm sure there were some documents for that, but I'm not sure it's better to pin Arthur or Daniel for that. Just to kind of get this history of what but there was, was a webinar or there wasn't I think no it's like there was essentially Arthur was in charge of doing that, and he at that time kind of potentially got covid nineteen oh, really? so, I mean like yeah, there was like you definitely need oh hold on a second, Arthur was writing a lot of blogs about what was happening, how coronavirus started, and then he had a huge blog post about his this so he got tested for COVID, but the test was negative. Oh. So, but he had all of the symptoms. The timeline was, you know, matching, etc. <laughs> and everybody's like, "Oh my God, this is so like ironic." But, uh, <laughs> but so in a sense, everything that is done within Cornwallis in this setup, when somebody takes a flag and just runs with it, and then the actual fighting unit joins that guy with a flag. So that was an example when, you know, the first guy just simply, guys, I'm sick, I'm out, and nobody was running that direction. But there was some material. So the idea for that webinar was to present what, what we did for round one submission in terms of what we actually have there. And we have this, uh, like, dashboard. So every team had that Kaggle notebook submission. And we wanted to present this to, again, uh, maybe some media, some experts, etc. But eventually what we get from all of this kind of like, oh, we already got medical experts on board talking with us. We don't need to do webinar anymore. Like we already got that milestone, right? Rockefeller Institute or University or Institute. Those people are talking with us. Dr. Tayab was speaking with us as well. So we kind of like, oh, okay, we, let's focus on actually moving forward in terms of this building, building stuff. Okay. Uh, oh, you said he maybe wrote some blogs? So uh, let me find it. There was a huge deal about the blog. Uh, was it on me Medium or something? Yes. Oh, okay. Maybe I should just search for that. Yeah, so probably search Medium, like Corona Y, and then you'll find some. We actually have the funny part. We have people like doing blog posts, etc. You know, people building their personal brands, etc. And then they produce something. They mention like, oh, you know, I'm part of this Corona Y thing, does something. But then you kind of, who is this guy? I can have interacted with him. So we, we have wow. this much bigger community than we even anticipate. That's why, like, when you when you mention like, oh, when you like some like there is, it's not possible to make any structure hierarchical structure over here because there are more action than kind of you can people connect people in terms of you know just simply that's why we're kind of like okay there should be some other solution and yes son come up with this valve proposal like okay let's do uh, flat and it works for game developers and for me, why I immediately kind of got into supporting that initiative is, was this. Our data infrastructure is like gaming engine. And now all of our teams, our data scientists, researchers, they're just these creators who create specific games. They are a literature review game, that game, but they all need game engine. And I'm like, yeah, this is exactly what we have. We have some teams that are working on engine, irrigation system, and other ones are building vertical teams and it worked for that environment so definitely get familiar with the, the wealth proposal 
it feels like there ought to be a, a visual graphic just of the structure of Corona Y, but it would be constantly changing. Yeah. Have, have Arthur showed you the, uh, like his big, big diagram that he has in Mira? No? Well, he put a diagram into the document that I was working on. You mean it's sort of a flow chart? Yeah, well, again, that was probably just like small section of his big diagram. So Arthur has really ridiculously huge thing oh, yeah? that kind of explains this whole elephant that I'm like, I mean, you definitely need to look into it. So let's let's ask him to, to share it with you. Yeah, maybe the thing, <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's because to me, everything what I was describing to you, like this, oh, this is the infrastructure irrigation system, what, what we do, it's just like one section of that whole picture so uh yeah it's even bigger okay yeah. well uh i think i need to take a break um yeah so let's uh i i'm going to keep working on it and maybe i'll mm. I'll, I'll dm you to say you know hey can you um yeah uh make some more comments and see what you think and yes go from there i'm not really sure yeah after I get kind of a completed work in progress draft, I'm not sure where this is going to live. <laughs> well, ev everything is a live documents. Like yeah. it's not possible to have this, like we don't like milestones work, but types of milestones when you kind of kind of say, okay, this is done. Like they don't work within Corona Y. Like any effort that we try to frame that way was always kind of like, no, no everything you just set up this, incremental steps and then it grows it needs still to grow and it takes time and because of this we were able to move very quickly at some point you kind of see a lot of things that oh we need to document this it's already like it's already done there is nothing to document that's again partially why we have this problem in the first place but you know we'll deal with it so uh, it was a great conversation yeah. feel free to reach out anytime please don't be overwhelmed and Remember, like a lot of things I was discussing, there were this out of scope of this literature review things. So I know that different people, like, like for me, I found my scope, what I'm focused on within Corona Y, and I become happy. I know that we had a lot of people who failed to find the scope, and they kind of get like, you know, overwhelmed and burned down. Like literally, right. we had people with kind of like, okay, guys, I need to take a break. Like I'm mentally, I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted. So yeah. Yeah. It, it's really hard. Like if, if your goal is just to cover everything, it, it will doom to fail because like super like it's too big. But within AI yeah, literature review with this projection of what Corona Y does there, I think this is exactly what you, you're striving to get. Like this document that describes all of this. And I'm, I'm really eager to help uh, making that document because I'm myself not a good writer but I definitely know the value and appreciate the value when it is put on paper, well described, multiple people kind of, you know, uh, can, like provide comments, suggestions, et cetera. And eventually it's not just like your thoughts in your head, your, your analogy of what we're doing here, right? This is not analogy, it's a projection on reality, what we're all building. So that's how I see that live document. Okay, well, I wonder, you know, if I kind of wrap up what I want to say about AI literature review at some point, do you think there'd be value in doing this for, say, the data infrastructure people and the, uh, say, the um, ontology people? Or do you think they've all got their own way of looking at it? Um, I think every team needs a help in this format of kind of like, okay, what you guys do here? right and within the team itself kind of knows what they're doing right and they will think like oh it's obvious what we do here especially the, the more technical you go the more sentiment you will get they're like yeah it's clear what we do here but in terms of having this track record of what is actually getting done and going everybody needs this type of help yeah. so you can any team and just kind of guys like what are you doing here like it's in like five, yeah. you know, like this. Like this. Right. So uh, I know that, uh, computer science people, we, like, there is like this concept of rubber duck prototyping or debugging. 
it's when you take that uh, rubber duck in front of your monitor and you try to explain your code to that duck. Yeah. And that way you can find uh, problems in what you're doing here. So uh, in a sense, I was employing that tactic in some of the teams when they kind of like, I'm like, hey guys, I know that we all have different ideas what we're going to do here. And I know that all of us think that we're all on the same page. So you know that to confirm this, let's do this rubber duck type of thing. And so uh, that type of approach definitely, helped. Like, I saw the benefits of doing something like this. But again, yeah. this is dumb approach. This is like only like rubber duck. Uh, I think what you're capable of doing is next level thing is, is not rubber duck. You have like a person with skill set of actually consuming the information, right? And then put it on a paper if it's not there yet. Or if it's already on the paper, polish it to like to, to, to make it, you know, a couple of notches better. So, I, I mean, I think your impact for, for this community will be huge in this capacity, so. Okay, well, we'll have to see. I just got some freelance work today, so I'm not sure how much time mm. I've got, but um, yeah. it's always good to get actual work, right? Yeah, and again, like right now, we, I think like since economies are opening up, et cetera, et cetera, and mm -hmm. we were expecting to have like less involvement of people, I mean, well, from day one, we're kind of like, okay, well, volunteers, like nobody can commit like a lot, but we had an experiment for, we were like trying to apply for a specific grant that eventually wasn't suitable for us because, you know, we're not actually an organization entity yet, <laughs> but, but we did, we, we went through the process and in fact, we were able to create a document. And so we have a table of people who are, uh, committed to for, for, for in a scope of that proposal for uh, for grant, grant proposal, we essentially got more than ten full time employ like time employment from multiple people. So, for example, like I'm, I'm I was saying, like you know what, I could do this engineering, and I'm, I'm I can commit ten ten hours a week or something, and mm -hmm. things like that. So. Even from this volunteer environment, like nobody, like nobody is responsible for anything, kind of. We were able to kind of find people who were like, okay, if the specific goal is well defined, here is a proposal. Like you know that structure uh, that uh, that you're striving to build. We immediately got buy-in from people, and again, I think it was made. I forget how many people were there, but in total, it was like really, like forty thousand hours a week commitment. 40,000 something so like 10 people full time and I'm like wow that's what, like it's immediate at that point I realized that's why we were able to move that quickly because it's not only like five people I'm interacting on a daily basis within Corona Y it's literally hundreds of people and for hundreds of people maybe we're moving too slow because we lack structure but you know it's a balance of, of things we're doing here yeah so in terms of activity, it's it's all there, and majority of people are having this sentiment like, I don't know why, but I'm committing too much for for Corona Y. I don't know why. Like, I like. Here is the thing. I I think it's not on the video yet. Yeah, it was like our really first conversation with Arthur when we've met, and he asked me, okay, like, hey, how many hours like do you think you'll commit for Corona Y? And I was like maybe three, four hours or something a week, like much more, much more than that after like all of this time. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's understandable. So again, feel free to take your time. And again, there is no rush in this process because this is like, I view it as a more process oriented approach, right? More systemic, systematic, right? The right word. And uh, right now, we're still in kind of transition from cowboy phase of, ooh, no, no time to explain. We just need to run. But now, for all of these things, we have ingredients in terms of executing this and all of the even more information that it's needed to actually formalize everything into deliverable. Mm -hmm. So that's why, again, you will have a hard time right now to kind of like, okay, there is so many things like what we actually put on paper. But we'll get there, we'll throw out, cut, trim all of the fat, and then it will be super lean 
lean uh, execution strategy. <laughs> so, I'm coming from startup world, Arthur as well. So all of the people who are talking about big ambitious ideas, we're all actually from startup world. So we know it's all about focusing like one thing and then do it right, super fast, because you don't have, like the time is the most valuable resource and so on. So I think we're on the same page regarding that. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. It was really nice talking to you. I will be in touch. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Katie. Bye -bye. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.